So it's important that to understand that storytelling is not like, let's go around and tell a story. No, no, there is a specific purpose. And we are going to do this today. My goal is not to stand here to talk for 45 minutes, okay? My goal is to actually do it. So we're going to do it. But before we do it, I wanted to set you up. But we're going to do the two-minute story. I'm sure some of you have heard of it. The two-minute story is everybody tells a story for two minutes. I'll get back to that in a moment. Give you the genesis of the story, where it came from. The two-minute story was the work of a man by the name of Marshall Gans, and another who developed it further by the name of Andy Goodman out of uh, the West Coast. During the civil rights movement, people sat around and told stories, generally of struggle, stories of you know, trying to make it and so on. And the result of the, the story was not in a vacuum, but rather that after you tell, told your story, there was a call for action, action to actually reach people to vote or a donation and so on. So that's basically the two-minute story. I'm sure I have more to say, but I'm going to set you up. What we need to do, everyone in, on, around the table I see, and I picked one of these. Everyone, can you all grab one? Now, I, I will ask you, and uh, I've been told by my kids and my students that I sound authoritarian. It's true. I'm just kidding. Um, what we want to do is have five people per table. All right, so if you're two people, you got to get with five people. That's really a good number, five people. <laughs> and you'll see why. Did I say I was authoritarian? Can we guys sit down? <laughs> All right, so we have five people per table. Uh, you have a piece of paper in your hand, and I'm going to actually set you up to actually tell stories. Yourself telling stories to the people around you, okay? Uh, before I go to that, just very quickly, that storytelling is the best, most effective way to communicate. And it is very emotional, actually. And that has existed in every culture forever. And the way we're going to do it is what we see on TV, the movies, etc., etc. So, um, anyways, back to our story. So you have one of these? I need one of you on the table to get their phone out so we can actually stop, uh, stopwatch, watch stop. One of you, one per table, please. And get it the stop, uh, the stop so you can actually uh, measure how many, how long the person has stopped, okay? And the person who has the, uh, the, wa the watch, please don't be too bossy. <laughs> because... <laughs> I don't fight over who's going to do it. <laughs> uh, so you have a while. You get up, uh, when we do the exercise, you need to put the, uh, whoever, has, whoever has the um, machine there, it's a, it's a telephone now, uh, put zero and then it goes to two, two minutes and give people a few seconds to finish, okay? Don't stop them at two. two <laughs> give them a couple of, a few seconds. Yeah. Okay, so the story has to be told for it to be effective. It has to be done this way, and it has to be done in the story arc, okay? So you need to tell people around the table a story about yourself where you actually struggled to get something, and eventually you got that thing. So it has to have a positive ending. I see people thinking, I like that, okay? So I'll give you an example, okay? Don't take it against me. But struggling to get that degree, that job, that partner, that house, that mate, whatever. And we all have a story like that, right? 
And uh, as I asked you, uh, you all have a piece of paper? Yeah. All of you? Good. We'll see. Uh, okay. So what you need to do then, when you go around, everyone tells their story. At the end of uh, the round, when everyone talks, you need to give this piece of paper to the person whose story affects you the most, you like the most. Now remember that you cannot vote for yourself. This is not politics. <laughs> I know there's people running for office here. Make sure you, can, make sure you, you, you give that to someone, okay? Um, I think that's about it for now. I might sit at a table and listen to some stories, but uh, I think that um, we had the panel, which was nice, but now it's time, I think, to be interactive and to really, and then at the end of the talk, at the end of your talk, we will listen to some stories, and then I will hopefully make a conclusion why in the digital world in which we live, and I've been hearing some absolutely amazing things in terms of what's going to happen in 40, 50, 60 years from now, and how this world is going to change. And uh, storytelling is somewhat of a pushback toward this. We're all the same. We all go online and so on. So, uh, go for it. Enjoy it. We'll, we'll regroup in about 10 minutes, okay? Go. Thank you. I'm going to talk to you in Arabic. Ah! Bonjour, S'il vous plaît, arrêtez de parler. Nous allons commencer. Please stop talking. We're going to restart. Uh, as I said, I'm told that I was bossy, authoritarian. I got It's a stereotype, so I got to live up to that. I think I'm doing pretty well, right? You're doing great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sir. Sit down. No. Yes, okay. Uh, can we just hold on to the questions, please? Just because of time, I'm told. I, we don't have a lot of time, but we, I would love, this is normally it takes an hour to do, so you understand, we're crunching everything up. So I'm just going to go around the table and ask you, oh, no, to raise your hand if you had actually four pieces of paper. Does anybody have four pieces of paper? Raise your hand. No? Three pieces of paper. Yes. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay. Two pieces of papers. All right. So, what is your name? Tamara. Tamara, you know what's going to happen, right? Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That part she knows. <laughs> it looks like a dancing floor, yeah? <laughs> it is. But that's all right. You think that I'm just kidding. Give her a big hand, people. Give her a big hand. Am I giving time to you? Hi, so my name is Tamara. Um, I was born and raised in London, England, immigrated to the United States uh, when I was nine years old. And um, the schooling system at the time in the 1960s in London was very different from what it was in the United States. So I arrived into fourth grade into Miss Avery's class in Chictawaga, New York, not knowing how to read. Not only did I not know how to read, but I didn't know the alphabet. So I hadn't learned A, B, C, D, E, F, all the way to Z. So I'm in school with a bunch of nine-year-olds, and I'm one of two African-American girls, all the rest of the kids are white, and I'm known as the dumb one because I can't read. Fortunately, Mrs. Avery was aware of the situation and had the learning specialist work with me and a white girl named Michelle, and um, Slowly but surely, I began to learn that B made the buh sound, A made the uh sound, T made the ta sound, put it all together, you get back. And fifth grade, I was pulled out, the dumb kid again, and pulled out with a boy named Brian, uh, five days a week, um, but it really paid off. And I worked really, really hard, and I did achieve the American dream we immigrants come here and we think this is the land of plenty and that all of the streets are paved in gold. And um, my parents wanted me to go to Harvard and I eventually did go to Harvard and graduate. And so all that work of my teachers um, 
really paid off in terms of me learning how to read, working really hard, and in many ways achieving the American dream. And I'll end with this, I paid it forward. So once I had graduated from graduate school, I volunteered in the community to help others learn how to read. So I was a tutor and I paid it forward. And now, although I have an MBA and was in corporate America for 15 years, I chose to do what Miss Avery did for me and become a teacher and help other kids learn how to read and write and achieve the American dream. So, thank you. Okay, uh, so you see this, this kind of activity. By the way, it's not my activity, I didn't invent the activity. I just want to make sure you understand. This has been going around since the, 50, since the 50s and 60s. And I've been going around the tables, I listen here and there. It's always new because you really, people, you get, go, talk about diversity, you go beyond the facade, the face, the, the height, the size. And uh, what is your name, please? Tamara, I mean, uh, it's an amazing story. Thank you so much. Can you give her another hand, please? It was <laughs> okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, they're like that, you know. A lot of time, it's very emotional, and storytelling is emotional. You understand? Uh, let's see. Uh, who has three? Uh, three. Three. I raise your hand. Who has two? Two. <laughs> two. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm bossy and I do everything. Who has two? Who has two? Two. Yeah, two. I want you to tell us your story, please. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Give him a hand. Give him a hand. Paul, thank you, Paul. Um, please, sir. Thank you. Hello. Uh, so... At our table, we talked largely about uh, relationships in our families. And uh, what I described was uh, what I still uh, thank God for every day as a miracle with relation to my daughter. Uh, I have a wonderful, lovely daughter who is dyslexic and had a lot of trouble in school. And she uh, partly for that reason, uh, I think, uh, got into some substance abuse problems, which I was uh, blinding myself to, or one way or another I was unaware. In any event, uh, she did graduate from high school, and she did some uh, college work, um, but it wasn't easy for her, and she had a very hard time, and she wasn't really very successful. Um, and I uh, have a, a, an office in, in town where I do my work, and I offered her a job in my office. And she took the job, and uh, that gave me a chance to observe her. And like I said, she was, I think, uh, in some substance issues. And um, she, she began to gain weight. She gained weight uh, quite dramatically. Now, uh, people do gain weight, and uh, I myself, you might say, have not skipped too many meals. And, uh, uh, but it, it sort of looks, it look, looks kind of natural in a way, you know. My daughter, it looked, it looked different. It, her, her, she carried the weight in, in some very strange ways, and I knew there was something wrong. And we took her to, she, she, she did go, she had a doctor, of course, and she went to the doctor. Um, and the, but the doctor failed to diagnose her and didn't really treat her. Uh, she, at, at one point, uh, started having trouble uh, uh, walking. Uh, she could walk for 50 feet or 100 feet. I didn't actually know this when it was going on, uh, but she eventually, but she later uh, told me about this. And, and 
my office is only about a block or maybe a little less than a block from the uh, MBTA entrance. And, and my daughter told me she would sometimes have to rest twice in, the, in that distance before she could make her way to the, the, the subway. She sometimes had to sit down on the sidewalk to rest. Uh, so that was not good. And uh, she, we, we eventually took her back to the doctor and, and she was seen. She, she was having trouble breathing and she was seen and the doctor said, well, I think this is uh, pneumonia. So they gave her pneumonia medicine, which actually made no difference whatever. And um, so she, she came back, she was, she was staying with us at that point and she, she came back to our house. And after... Uh, five or six days of no improvement, we, my wife and I decided that we had to do something about this and we took her to an emergency room. And at that point, she was seen by a, a, a doctor who was a little more, uh, paid a little more attention to some of the details. And he said, you know, this is not pneumonia. This isn't anywhere near pneumonia. This is heart failure. And you're going to the... Uh, to the Boston uh, or Beth Israel uh, in, in, in Boston, and you're going right now, and I'm calling an ambulance for you. So they took her to Beth Israel. The people in Beth Israel uh, realized that she was, was having a very s severe uh, heart failure problem. Her heart function was down to 12%, which is not what you want. Um, but thank, thank heaven, she. Uh, uh, got the treatment, and uh, she was in the intensive care unit for 10 days, which is kind of a long time, but she did get the, 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 the treatment, and they, they figured out what it was, what was going on with her weight gain, which was basically uh, fluid, and, and so they gave her treatment for that, and uh, I can tell you that she, ha she has, she, she recovered, she, she lost about 60 or 70 pounds, which is quite a lot. Uh, and she is now just doing very, very well. She's addressed the substance abuse problem, partly because uh, she realized as a result of, of her health issue that she really had to deal with that. And, 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 and she has, and she's, she's been uh, healthy now for about two and a half years. And, and I, I, like I said, I, I thank God every day that I, I feel like I get, my daughter was, we were, we we're supposed to talk about things that we got, that we wanted. Well, I got my daughter back. Wow. Well, uh, when you do these kind of things, uh, this is, it happens a lot. It's very emotional. Uh, but also uh, because, I hate to keep repeating time, time but because of time, uh, I'm just going to want to close this a little bit, okay? And then if you have any questions, I know some people do, we can do that as well, okay? But very briefly, I'm going to be just a little technical. All of you have done one thing. You have performed what is called the three-act story. The first act is who's the protagonist? What is the inciting incident as in Paul's case, or most of your cases? That's the first part. The, the first act. The second act is the barriers. And all these stories have barriers that you have to overcome. And finally, you get the goal, what the French call dénouement, which means to unravel. And all stories from every probably movie you see, TV show, most of them, are based on the three-act play, which is also be based on the, uh, the hero's journey. Though the journey of the hero, uh, a lot of it was a uh, uh, written uh, by a man with the name of Joseph Campbell, uh, who wrote these books. But it goes all the way back to the time of Homer and the Odyssey and going 10 years and so on. Um, so that's the basic approach if you wanted to do something, tell a story about your organization, take in a single person, okay? And tell how your organization, institution, your idea, yourself. And people understand that. It's it's a very, very effective way to communicate. And uh, finally, what I wanted to say is, is um, this. Um, as you can see, I have no PowerPoint. Uh, 
no paper, nothing, well, the little papers you had, but, but my point is this, I've been teaching for almost 30 years, and by the way, I failed to mention I'm from Morocco, so a uh, little propaganda for Morocco. <laughs> uh, but for a long time, so I've seen students coming before the internet and after the internet, and so on and so on. But I can only imagine what's going to happen in the future, and I'm very concerned, like a lot of people, that we're getting so digitalized. I see these kids continually, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, storytelling in the old-fashioned way that we did here today is really a sort of pushback. Because I think what's happening in the world, and I travel to Morocco and Europe where I grew up and so on, and I see that people are becoming similar and similar wherever you go. And that is because of this digital world, a lot of it. And so I think to sit down with your child, your friend, your loved ones, uh, and to, to exchange stories. And you get to know people. I don't know Paul, but I'm not going to forget Paul. Or the lady, Tamara, right? Or Tamara. Or that young lady over there, raise your hand. Beautiful story that I heard, um, because of time. So, we have a few minutes. I know you raised your hand. No, oh, I'm good. You sure? <laughs> it was? Yes, thank you. Though. All right. Uh, uh, Michelle, are we good with time? Yeah, we're All right. So, we, we're done? Yeah. We're good? All right. Yeah, Do you want to hear one more story, or you're okay? <laughs> okay? Listen, it's been a pleasure. It's always fun to share with people my passion. For storytelling, I just want to end by saying this. When I was a child in Morocco growing up, uh, we didn't have any television. Uh, I have eight, actually 11 brothers and sisters, right? I'm one of them. And uh, we didn't have any TV, not because TV didn't exist. I'm not that old, right? Uh, but because we didn't have, we were poor. And we always looked forward when my mother uh, would sit us down and tell us stories. And it was absolutely amazing. It was a beautiful time that I continue to recall. In fact, part of the reason why I do this is just kind of to bring back this memory. So to me, it's kind of coming back home. Thank you so much. Thank you.